very good evening to you. Thanks for joining us on this Thursday edition of the show. It promises to be exciting. As always, I'm Yemi Adebayo. Of course, today uh, we'll still continue with our post-mortem of uh, the Super Eagles failure to qualify for the 2022 FIFA World Cup. We're going to have a robust discussion around uh, all the things that could have been done, should have been done. And of course, we'll look at uh, the way forward. I'm not going to be alone on the show. We're going to have an interesting discussion. Uh, and of course, my partner, Austin Okon Akman, is uh, ready to go as we take this trip across the money spinning world of sports. Spotty greetings to you, Yemi, and of course, to our viewers joining us from different parts of the world. Always a delight to come around to talk sports in London. I'm Austin Okon Akman. Yemi, so much. Talks after the Super Eagles failed to book a place mm -hmm. at the Qatar 2022 FIFA World Cup. I, I look, I've not seen Nigerians express so much disappointment uh, over the Super Eagles like I've, like I've you know, seen and heard them talk in the last two days. I really just hope that the Nigeria Football Federation, the Ministry of Youth and Sports Development, will find a way to make good use of this window. Because remember, we had Judge Abbey on this show uh, on Tuesday, and he said, look, it might just be a blessing in disguise. I just hope that we will learn this time around, you know, invest in deliberate planning, long-term planning, purposeful, and, you know, trying to find a way to turn our football around. It's not the end of the world. It doesn't mean we won't play football again. The FIFA rankings out today, not so bad for Nigeria. So let's look at the positives and say to ourselves that it's time to grow. All right. Um, on Tuesday, you talk about positive, uh, and today you talk about positive again. <laughs> I'm very sure a lot of the fans mm -hmm. would, would ask you, Austin. That's the only thing we can do. <laughs> po yeah. Positives where, all right, uh, just, just trying to make light of it. In, in everything, there are always positives, you know, but of course, a lot of people still feeling the pain. All right, Austin, let's uh, uh, continue with the show, but first, let me quickly introduce uh, our partner in the Lagos studio uh, to get his thoughts on everything that uh, went down. Bolo Money joins us and... Um, well, it's good to have you with us today. And let me ask you your thoughts <laughs> on uh, Nigeria's failure to qualify for, uh, for the World Cup. Good to be here on the day after the day after. <laughs> uh, well, uh, too many things to pick from it, from uh, poor tactics to poor positioning to poor understanding to uh, failure to even respect uh, incident on the country, everything all around. But um, Austin said something about positives. Um, I listened to a friend this morning and um, I really enjoy what he said. He said, Beyond sacking coaches, beyond bringing in a new coach, I think we need a proper structure. Look at England. They have, I think it's called eight or ten years to success. Look at what Germany did. Look at what France have. I think the same thing with Spain. Check the Spanish national team. Check their women's team. Check their underage. There's a process. They have structures. Is that we should look out for having like a, a real director, someone in the place of Emenalo. I think he has left his position at Monaco. I don't know where he is now. Someone like Sheyo Lofinjano. People who understand the game, both on the home front and abroad, who understands how to spot talent. Who can be I think, the bridge. Yeah, who can blend both together. I, I think we need to grow beyond it. It's supposed to be good that we didn't qualify so we can learn from it. But we've been here before and we didn't learn. One of our best learnings, let me pull it like that, was in 2013. When we failed to qualify for 2012, we brought in uh, Steve Keshi. Then for home-based players, the ones he selected, he had a long time to train with them constantly. And when it's time to play international games, he blends them with the foreign players. When they go, the home base, he still kept them. Go and play early game, come back. So there was a growth from there. And we won the AFCON a year after. You can call it fluke, you can call it whatever, I don't care. We won the AFCON. And going to the World Cup the following year, we got to the second round. Unfortunately, Onazu was probably our best player on the night, got injured, and at least we lost to a very good side in France. So the question is, what should we do from now? Look out for that. We may not even, the World Cup is in four years. Luckily, our players are young but we still have even younger players everywhere. For example, journalists shouldn't be the ones scouting players for the coaches. That way, journalists will bring who they think, okay, I can make money from. This is my friend. This is, okay, I know this one more. Because I know Yemi does not mean Yemi is better than Austin. So mm -hmm. I think we should look out for, look at the island goalkeeper. He's, in, he's an Urubo man. Maybe if you had scouted him earlier, 
we could have gotten him. I'm not saying he's the best that we can get. If we had done better with someone like Bukayo Saka, maybe people tell you he has nothing to do with Nigeria. I say it like his father schooled in Ogun State. His father schooled in Nigeria. That means there's affiliation with Nigeria. If we had done our job earlier, Okay. And those things can happen when we have someone who understands mm -hmm. talent, sport. Hopefully, we'll learn from yeah. this. And we, we don't want to go to the World Cup. Let's prepare for our <laughs> qualifiers. And all right. Uh, Boli is talking about deliberate planning and all the nations he mentioned went through some of the things Nigeria will go through mm -hmm. in the next four years. True. They plan for it. Yeah. I remember the disaster France went through when Bulgaria came to Paris, <laughs> defeated them in Paris, and they didn't qualify for uh, US in 94. Uh, England even didn't mm -hmm. qualify that year as well. And all of these countries found yeah. a way to bounce back. And you see, in the next four years, True. because of deliberate planning, they are over it That's and, the and, and, and they're doing it. But mm -hmm. the, the fear for most of us, and I, I'm very sure Austin shares this yeah. as well. Bolu said, mm -hmm. ideally, we're supposed to learn. But the question is, are we going to? Because you hear all of the things That's happening. So Nobody is holding their hands up and yeah, saying, yeah. you know, blame me too. It's, it's, we are hearing coaches and all that. In mm. other climes, Football Association presidents are resigning yep. and resigning. So look, I don't know. I just hope we'll learn. I just hope we'll learn. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's why I said, uh, look, we, we need to, to just sit on the positives. And the, one of the positives would be people being real with themselves. If you know yeah. you can no longer administer football in Nigeria, just take a bow. You've tried your best, you know. And why this is so tough on us is because of the win at all cost situation that we always put ourselves into. Italy won the Euros, yeah, me. They will not be at the World Cup. Yeah. They've picked themselves back up. They've played friendly. Mm -hmm. It's work in progress. They are not stopping. They know something is wrong. Remember, they missed out of the 2018 FIFA yeah. World Cup yeah. and now came back, won the Euros, and now they are not qualifying. So they'll say, wait, some, there's something wrong. They're not getting the strategy right, you know? So they will keep working. So I just hope that we, we, we get to understand that. Let's put a pause on that yeah, conversation. Okay. Now, I like the way the Angu Bolu, you know, took it, that we rely a lot on foreign talents because we think that they can come back home and then do the magic. But sometimes, what sort of environment are they coming to meet? And we've got a lot of boxers right here in the UK. Yeah, me, they love Nigeria. I've mm -hmm. spoken to Lawrence, and yeah. we've had Dan Aziz on the show, Richard. They are all Nigerian-born boxers doing so well. That's Lawrence Okoli right there. Uh, first time he's coming back home as a kid. Is the world... He holds the WBO cruiserweight belt. Look at him right there. He's proudly Nigerian. And what is the ultimate desire of this sort of uh, boxer? He says he wants to bring a world title bout to Nigeria. We've heard Larry Ekundayo talk about this also. We've heard Dan Aziz talk about this. Even Anthony Joshua loves Nigeria so much. But they're coming to meet an environment that is not prime to take boxing to that level where they want it to be, you know? I just hope that with the coming of Lawrence Okoli to spark up some level of interest, he has said that it will inspire young boxers in the country, and I totally agree with Lawrence Okoli. Let's listen to Lawrence. There was a presser today in Lagos. Lawrence is loving it back home. Listen to him, I'll come back on the show. Um, yeah, for me, it's uh, the last time, I think... My parents were very um, active in bringing us back when we were younger. Um, obviously, I've gone on and doing my own thing. So this is my first time back in a long time. But now that we've opened the door to coming back, I believe it's something that I do very often. Um, in terms of actually stuff that we're going to do here, I think, as I said, it's so important to me to just highlight talent in Nigeria. You know, obviously, I'm born in, in England, but with my parents, they always instilled the fact that you're Nigerian, you're Nigerian. So, now that I'm here, it's important, not just myself, people like Anthony Joshua, who uh, I'm very close to, people like Israel Adesanya, people who have gone and become champions, I understand that as, as much as it's training, a lot of it is down to the fact that we are Nigerian and it does give us physical strength and attributes that can't be ignored. So I think there's so much talent here and it's important. I think even while I'm here now, it'll be good. I don't know how we can, but just get maybe like some giveaways for the local um, boxing boxing guys. If they can come and show a bit of talent as well, we can see what we can do. I think it'll be nice to see some um, of the boys maybe training and sparring. Um, that's definitely something that needs to happen while we're out here. Um, another thing as well is that before I'm retired, or in, I need 
the opportunity to box in Nigeria. I think that for me, it's, it hasn't been done in many years that I know that you know world champions have come back, um, and I think that that needs to be sort of facilitated. I think for my dad to see you know where he's grown up, for his son to come and actually you know fight here with, with a world title and everything is going to be important. I think that it's um, important to obviously remember the struggles and where you come from before you get to this stage. Um, when I was younger, before I started boxing, I was um, bullied um, in England because um, my African name is Ikechuku. Um, that name, people in England don't really understand it or know how to say it. So that was part of bullying as well as being overweight. So with the boxing, I was able to train my mind, train my body, get into better condition. Same with working at McDonald's. Um, you know, my parents um, tried as hard as they could for me and my um, me and my other siblings. Um, I worked in McDonald's and managed to go from there to show hard work and dedication you can get anywhere. So when you listen to some of these superstars and their stories, uh, you understand that it is only when you quit, it is over. They've got beautiful stories, you know, and, and I mean, listening to Lawrence O'Coli, uh, the best part of the conversation is, is when he said the motherland gave him his strength, you know, blocked everything. And he's saying, because I'm proudly Nigerian, that's why I'm strong. It's a good transformation story. I talked about growing up, being bullied, being overweight, and it brings us again back to the power of sports, all the things he's been able to overcome and get to this stage. And now he's on top of his game. He's bringing it back to the motherland, trying to help kids. Then it also brings us back to that problem we talked about. Will the system allow people like this thrive? I mean, they're used to best mm. standards. They're used to standard practice. And, and once they come here, uh, you know, you, you just hope that they don't get frustrated with, with, you know, probably with structures not in place and, and the whole whatnot. But I do hope uh, with all of this, we're, we're seeing everything will trickle down, we'll get our policies right, get our acts right, and, and, and we'll be able to uh, get things right. All right, we, we need to move on. For, you know, hopefully, uh, all, all the best to Lawrence Okole and all the things he hopes to help to get done here in Nigeria. Uh, like we said, we're conducting a post-mortem of Nigeria's failure to qualify for the 2022 FIFA World Cup. We're trying to see a lot of angles, look at all of the stories. And on the show tonight, we're going to have an, an ex-footballer, uh, somebody who was, who was able to combine education and football, who's seen it all, uh, was able to you know, get his studies in the mix, and he also started from here. And so you're looking at all of that, uh, it should be good to have a you know, conversation with him. Tony Abbas joins us uh, on the show uh, tonight. It's good to have him. Greetings to you, Tony. Thanks for finding out time to be with us on the show. Okay, um, you, you, might, you might have to... You might have to unmute. We, we, we can't hear you. So uh, we'll get back to Tony. He has to unmute so that we can have uh, this conversation uh, with, with him. Uh, while we're trying to do that, um, there's no doubt we need to get our acts together. That's the most important thing. Um, your word is deliberate. That deliberate is very, very key. No, oh, they want us to do some. Let's just hurry this up. Because if, for example, uh, what... You may or may not like Randy Waldron, but when he came on board, he said he has a 10-year plan. And that way we know, okay, this guy is looking at, we may not do well at the Women's World Cup, but if we see progression. So I'm looking, okay, let me see what will happen in the next two, three, four years. There has to be a set plan. Not tell us, I remember this problem that was telling us at the point, that, okay, that we are having so many, 10 number of years. No, not just say things people want to hear, because if we don't plan well, we may go for 2026. Then what happens in 2030? Luckily for us, unlike the days of the Germans and all, we have a young squad. Yes, we have the Gallows Mosas, who probably will never play for Super Eagles again. But we have young players in the team in defense, as Shemia Jaye, Omero, um, Calvin Bassi, Zaydu Sanasi, Tai Olaino. These are young players. Even in the midfield, we have young players. And it is not old. We have younger players. But there has to be a plan. You know, 
if there is a plan and there's huge competition in the team, because for example, in the got injured and uh, we scrambled to find a replacement, we had to bring a player that was not even on the standby mm -hmm. list to replace. But imagine a team where sometimes you may not have the best players, but and some person will tell you if you have like 20 players who train together every day, even if they average, they will become planning. superstars. So if we plan very well, intentional planning, not just um, let's put things together. No, plan it well. We will see the... Pro we, for, I think it's Ajax. From age 10, you know about the 433 formation. So you are not going to say, oh, what formation? Nah. From age 10 all through your academy years, from under 18 to 20, right. you know this is our right. style. That's been deliberate. All right, that's been deliberate. Hopefully we'll be able to get that right, get our own identity and, and sort ourselves out. All right, Tony Abbas is back uh, with us. Uh, Tony, <laughs> thanks for uh, finding out time to be with us on the show. We're trying to pick the pieces and uh, trying to let go of the pain and heal and move on. Uh, but first, let me get your thoughts on uh, the issues related to the Super Eagles and their failure to qualify for the World Cup. Thank you uh, very much. And it's an honor to be part of this um, discussion. Like, um, I'm a Nigerian, like you said, and I've been based out of Nigeria for over two decades. And uh, Apologies again, my voice. I lost my voice yesterday. I was um, at the stadium with my daughter yesterday playing basketball. So look, like my son John sort of left Nigeria, you know, for greener pasture, so to say. Uh, look, I think I... What happened on Tuesday was a blessing in disguise. A blessing in disguise in that um, we, we, um, we've been the solution for many years. Um, what, what I meant by that, we go to competitions with a fire brigade approach. We win and lose sometimes, and they, we did not sit down. I think it's been said by uh, some of the panelists. This fire brigade approach has actually made us to believe that we can do this every time and get away with it. It's time to see it up. It's time to have a structure. It's time to have a strategic policy that will actually um, determine where our football is going. This does not, this is not synonymous with football um, alone in Nigeria. It's about our life. It's about Nigeria. It's about a people that are wanting to actually achieve something. I, I see a few people, I mean, all, most of the time when I have this discussion with a few Nigerians in the diaspora and in Nigeria, uh, the government is not good. Let us change uh, Zeke. Let us put Awolowo. Let us change uh, uh, Mr. Tony Abbas and put uh, um, um, maybe Bolu. Look, it's a systemic thing. And if you don't get to the root cause of that thing, you're gonna, you go, you're just gonna, you're gonna be putting ramp pegs in them, a square, whatever it is. So for me, I think the most important thing is just first of all to sit down from this loss and think about the future. There are, I'll call them experts. We've mentioned some of them in the diaspora. There are even a few experts in Nigeria. Let them sit down, let them sit down, sit down and think about the future of Nigerian football. That is very, very critical. Another important thing is for us as a people to actually know what sort of philosophy we want to have. So if we won the game on Tuesday, we'll be going with all hopes to Qatar to do what? To participate. It's not, it's not good enough. I'll give, you the, I'll give you the Brazilian example. Brazil will always be Brazil. But one thing we have not done as a nation is to have a system that will be there for us whatever happens. If you have 50 players in, in, in mass or maybe in uh, whatever place, as far as you have that philosophy, if Victor Sime is not playing, whoever is going to play is going to still adapt or adhere to that philosophy. It's missing in Nigeria. And it's, it's, it's something that we need to work on. Another thing about that game, like I said, it reminds me of the situation in Nigeria. We are, we fail to actually address the fundamental issues and we're wanting to have the best result. If you have Clinton, Obama, 500 Obamas and put them to rule Nigeria, I, I, I will be referring to that in this conversation, because it sort of sort of tells you what is happening in Nigeria. People will blame whoever is there. I'm not going to blame Egbavon or the coaching crew. It's the system that puts them there that we have to overhaul. If we don't overhaul this system, we'll keep repeating the same mistake. Let me give you the instance of, of, of about three coaches 
Westerhoff, Otto Gloria, um, name them. They had this philosophy. Westerhoff was in charge of Nigerian football. He actually got a few Nigerian players to go to Hol- Holland. Yeah, Finidi George, Babangida to Jani. So when they're playing for Nigeria, they have that Nigerian mentality and the Dutch philosophy that I was trying to embed. So we had a successful thing with Westerhoff. Other coaches like Otto Gloria had the same thing. But what yeah. we have now, you're going to take Bolu and put Bolu to be a coach because he's good. All right. What about... So it's, for me, I yeah. think it's more like looking at the fundamental yeah. issues. And I think that's the core thing we have okay. to face. Yeah. You know? uh, l- let me put you on pause. Uh, we're enjoying this conversation, but we need to go on a break right about now. When we return from that break, we'll just pick it up from where uh, we-, we left it. All right. So let's go on that break. We'll come back for more. It's supposed to make. All right, I was still having a um, conversation uh, with uh, Tony Abbas, and he's been uh, filling us in with what he thinks uh, should happen. Uh, let me throw this one in. Uh, I'm also with my colleague, Austin Okon Akwan, uh, and of course, he will be also uh, asking you a few questions. But one for me before uh, I pass the bit into Austin. Uh, Tony, one for me, a lot of people have said, and you've alluded to that as well, but, but um, a lot of people have said, at this point, we should allow... Uh, professionals, whatever that means, mm. professionals run our football, not people mm. who are considered maybe politicians or people who probably are not passionate uh, about the game. So when we begin to talk like that, what, what qualifies somebody to be called an expert trade? What, what, what qualifies somebody to say he has a technical know-how and should be allowed to mm. handle uh, football matters? Uh, 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 that was a good question. And uh, I'm going to refer to Sunday Olize when we had uni days. And uh, I remember it was Nuga game, so I can't remember, Calabao. So I had this ID card from Olize. He was playing for Julius Berger. And I would take his ID card. He didn't know. And I was sort of trying to show the girls that I play for a big club. I was still playing amateur for Union Bank. He said something to myself and other other. Um, our colleagues, he said, if you want to play soccer to the highest level, I'm telling you, there are certain things you have to actually fulfill. And uh, he mentioned some of them, and up till today, I'm holding tenaciously to those things because I'm impacting on the younger ones in Australia. So, Olise, as a person, had um, the trappings to be a very, very technical person. And that was actually seen by the handlers of the Super Eagles. So, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to go to maybe uh, the school of uh, coaching or whatever. It is essential that you have a coaching certificate, but you must have it. So what I mean by that is that you must have those the, uh, other qualities. For me, I think the basic thing is for you to be astute in soccer. At the same time, philosophy of maybe um, whatever you're going to be into, for example, if you want to be an accountant, you can be good in school, but if you, have, if you don't have practical knowledge, you won't be a good accountant. It's the same thing with soccer. So, Olise had that technical know-how, and he, he was savvy in other areas. He was, I'll, I'll call it, um, soccer smart. So, Mourinho is a soccer smart coach. I, I, I will not talk about Mourinho's credentials. So, you have to combine two things. I love the Gavon. We've been saying this on the Lagos Legends platform. Let the experts do it. It's not the experts. They should have other things. They must be strategic. They must be strategic planners. If you have a coach who is good at soccer analysis, it doesn't win you games. We have to be. That's why I'm a believer of combination of the diasporans and local people. If you have um, Sunday Olize, who has been based outside of Nigeria for many years, he's still going to struggle. So let's get, and that was what happened to West Ham. West Ham understood Nigeria. He told Nigeria that I'm in Nigeria already. So you don't just want to bring Mourinho from Russia or where, wherever it is and say, hey, we have the best coach in Mourinho. The technical know-how is just, for me, I think it should be more than you knowing soccer, more than being serving in soccer. And again, you must have the support of your employer. If those three things are there, I'm telling you, we will be world beaters. So don't just listen. I'll call it be a pillow talk. Oh, let's get the expert. Who are the experts in this football thing? It's not just knowing coaching. So my submission will be 
Let's not look for people that are savvy in soccer, technical astute, sound people. Then you have to look at, at other things, not just um, the, the uh, knowing soccer. So that's my own take. I, 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 I'm a coach, but I'm not set to coach because I have other things that are uppermost in my mind. And I've not gone to the same level like Olize, but Olize is higher than me or maybe other coaches like Eguavon. But uh, there are other fundamental things that you must have. One of them I just told you. Uh, okay, person- okay, Tony, let me just let me just come in. Uh, you're making a whole lot of points. Thank you once again for joining us. Uh, it is what it is. We are here now. Nigeria yeah. will not be at the World Cup in Qatar. You are right yeah. there in Melbourne, Australia, and you can see that they've got a system that works. I'm sure yeah. that's why you've been there for, for over two yeah. decades now. Let's talk yeah. about what ex-internationals just like you can do for the development of football in the country because this is our sport. We love it. Now we all feel bad because we didn't qualify. What can you do to make a Thank you. difference? I was talking to, I, I think he was going to return my call. You must, some, some of you will know him. Olumide Aris, ex-international. Um, yeah. Chooks Akuneto is based in the UK. Okay. I'll call him coach's coach. Chooks Akuneto is an internationally acclaimed technical director. I had a chat with him. I said, probably channels were going to invite me to a, a platform today and would be good to actually get you guys on board. He said, why, why, why not? We're experts. I'm part of a structure here, a footballing structure, Melbourne City that is owned by Manchester City. I assist young people just like pathways, creating part. And I actually learned what sort of management is all about. You mentioned it. I think you mentioned it. It was Austin or well, you were talking yeah. about creating that strata where um, I saw this in Korea. I played in the Asian Champions League. I was in a school. Um, Six-year-olds, five-year-olds were actually made to pick a career. If you want to do boxing, you will fix the boxing, um, whatever. So give them five to ten years, Korea, Japan, they're going to be world better. So the same thing should apply in Nigeria. Why, where people in the diaspora, the technical experts, the technical people, like so, um, um, Chooks Akuneto will be invited home to see what you can do. But these people are ready to, I've said this many times, I work in the local government sector. I'm ready to sacrifice and come to Nigeria to help with local governance in Nigeria. So we should get some of these experts in diaspora who are wanting to come home for free to help motherland. I call, look, look at what I'm dressed. I don't know fundamental thing I'm going to tell you to look at. I'm dressed for work. I said this when I met the Nigerian High Commissioner. I said, we are part of Nigerian problem, but we are oblivious of this. I'll, I'll challenge you now, um, Austin. You are donning an, uh, um, your suit and your jacket and everything, and you live in Nigeria. Why are you doing this? You are doing this because of that colonial whatever. We have to abrogate this thing from our headset. If we don't, uh, no, it's a, it's a call to all of you. Why are you putting this on? So, we're, we're running out of time. I just wanted to, you know, yeah. I've, I've been, I've been, I've been pushing this charge to everyone that mm-hmm. loves football in Nigeria. <clears throat> that what can we do? I want to know, like for for instance, you're from a state in Nigeria. Have you contacted the NFF? What mm-hmm. have you done for your state FA? Have you impacted football at the schools level, at the grassroots? Mm-hmm. What can we do in our own little ways to make use of this window that we're not going to the World Cup? Yeah, I, I was going to finish on that. So what we plan to do from the diaspora, we are going to take it with the middle years. Middle years predominantly will be the eight years and above. So we are going to take it all with schools where we're going to have the play. Maybe probably Igalo. Igalo is a high-profile player. We are going to go to schools to talk to them about certain life skills. No, we're not starting with football. So fundamentally, we want to embed on them what it is to play soccer, but we're going to start from scratch. Like I said, it's a faulty situation, it's a faulty state we are in, no matter who you bring it. So we're going to actually refurbish. This, this kids will relearn. So we're putting this up there. Number two, there is going to be, like, like I said, a strata, like eight year to 12, 12 to 14, for then they will play with themselves. Then if we need um, the cadre for that age group, we can actually go there and say, look, we have this under 15 that are based in Ogun State or in Kaduna. That should be there. 
I heard whether yourself or someone else talking about it. We need to. I can't explain that enough on this platform. Maybe if you have other platform, I will explain. You. you have to create that. But we are starting. I think that's, this so I think that's a good place to leave it. Um, we're, we're starting this. Need, we're starting this. We just need to. We just need to. I totally get where okay. you're coming from, and we will find a time where we will just discuss how states yeah, yeah. can come into it, how the diaspora can also come into it. Thank you so much for joining us on the program. We'll get Thank some you. more uh, time to bring you on the show. Thank you so much. My pleasure. All right. So that's it. Ex International talking about speaking to us from Melbourne in Australia. Let me take the conversation back. To Bolu. Bolu, I said this is the time for everyone to come around and see what we can do for the development of football in the country. Do you agree? Well, um, 100%. Uh, this is the period of all hands on deck. Everyone, everybody, as much as you can, including myself. Uh, even though I have a few plans to do, hopefully things work out well. I think everyone needs to do the best way you can. Uh, yes, we know we do. When it's time to criticize, we do. And um, as much as we do that, when we have opportunities to also say the right things, yeah. when we have opportunity to meet the right people, we should do. If I see the NFF president now, I can suggest something to him. It doesn't mean he will flow all through, but at least I know my conscience will be clear that I've said one, two, three to him. So I think everybody, like he, um, Abbas Riley said that they are planning on something. I think everyone should have their ways. Like I said earlier, Igalo and Musa may not play for the Super Eagles again, but it still doesn't mean they can't find ways to impact. It still doesn't mean they can't do some things for their state. It still doesn't mean they can't find things to do with academies. We need the next superstars. And the best time to plan this was 10 years ago. The next best time is now. We shouldn't yeah. go to say, well, we're not at the World Cup. Well, we'll wait for four years. If we wait for four years, if we go to the World Cup, we come back. BLL, we say, but no, we should go <laughs> past that. We should have targets of, okay, let's try and get to the quarterfinal for right. the first time. When that works, let's see semifinal. Hopefully, we won't have to come back here in four years and start talking about the same thing over again. I, I pray so. I pray so. Uh, if you play back our show four, five, six years, <laughs> we probably had a conversation like this. Mm -hmm. That's the sad part. I hope will learn. All right, let's get, let's get into the news of the day today. Didn't come as a surprise, really. Uh, the Nigerian Football Federation has disengaged uh, the Super Eagles coaching crew and has also withdrawn the two-and-a-half-year contract offer that was on the table uh, while interim uh, technical advisor Augustine de Guavon has stepped down. This is following that the Super Eagles failure to qualify for the 2022 FIFA World Cup in Qatar after losing out to Ghana on away goals rules in the final qualification round. A new coaching crew will be announced after a proper review to lead the Super Eagles to face future challenges. All right, uh, this is what we got from the NFF uh, today. Uh, Bolo, quick one. Uh, were you surprised? Well, um, uh, the surprise is a government resigning. Resigning from what? It's not your, 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 you don't have a job initially because what we know he has is, is there as interim. So whatever happens, it may not even be the one if they are qualified to leave there to work. So I don't know, the, if he's resigning, it shouldn't be the technical director of NFF. That one is resigning. What he did with the Super Eagles is not resignation. And for the team, um, I, I remember when Egypt got eliminated from AFCON in 2019 on home soil. The, the, the FA president sacked everyone, then resigned himself. That's it, making bold statement. Uh, we've seen Carlos Correos resign. I, I wish I could find a way to make Algeria join the teams that qualify. You could see how broken Belmadi was on the floor in tears. Even his players were the ones consoling him. Then after that, he stepped down. I think there are reports also that the FA president I of Algeria down. has stepped down. I think that should be a bold move. I Proper said, house cleaning. And the truth is, um, even this tenure of NFF expires in September. So I think stepping down now will probably be a bold step that, okay, well, I wish we could have, especially now mm -hmm. that the two-month-old video is now circulating everywhere. So, like people will tell you, resigning or stepping out in Nigeria is like a taboo. Mm -hmm. I know we don't do that until we get the axe, but this was expected. But again, they said carefully look at. I hope they carefully look at this time around. I, tell, I don't care who the coach is, Nigerian, expatriates, so long we get the right persons to do the right things. Not, I, same thing I said, I don't care about a quota system for NPFL players. No. My take has always been, if you invite the NPFL players, let them have the same equal opportunity as the foreign guys. Some journalists said it to my face that when Okoye was in Division 4 on the bench, he was better than every goalkeeper in the NPFL. That's how biased we can be. So, I want equal opportunity for NPFL players. I remember Lokosa scored 19 goals in 21 games in 9 PFL. He was called to play not as a striker, as a right winger. 
45 minutes, that was game over. Then, Simi Wako, who scored 11 goals in two years, was taken to the World Cup because he played as a guy. So, mm. we have to be intentional about everything we do. If you are choosing, whoever is choosing the coaches has to be someone who has experience on what understanding of a coach will be. Not um, Bolu who analyzes. Okay, because Bolu is my guy. He analyzes, he will know. No. Choose the right people to yeah. select the right people and hopefully we'll move on from there. My, my, my worry has always been, and a lot of people would think, oh, yeah, me saying this because we didn't qualify. I've, I've always had a problem with just facing the national teams. And, and here we are. We failed to develop uh, our, our football on the domestic scene. We're picking up scraps. Even underage football. You know, what happens to our underage games? And, and, and the question about can an indigenous coach handle the national team, it, it will linger on, and that, that needs to, to, to be resolved. Um, and, and enough blames to go around. Enough blames to go around. Uh, but but yeah. we'll see where this will um, lead us. There should be house cleaning, basically. I know, and and you, you can see that people are not saying, "Oh, why? Why did the NFL, you know, ask the, the technical crew to to go?" You know, because people are hurting. You know, as Bolu mentioned, the Algerian uh, FA president and the entire board have resigned after Algeria failed to qualify for the World Cup. You know, I mean, it, it just says you can't you can't deliver, you can't get the job done. So we're waiting. You know, there must be something for Nigerians in this, if we are not going to the World Cup, you know, we must be sure that we now have people who can, you know, lead our football. Top of it all, A.B. Egbe, uh, Moni Mitchell said something important. I said, pitches play an important part in a country's football. Yeah. It's very important. Infrastructure development so that your country will have an identity where they play football. Very, very important. Uh, that said, uh, Cerezo, I've been trying to call you. I think it's good to get us to Negwavon. Let's, you know, Nigerians would like to hear from you. If you want to come say you're sorry, if you want to, you know, say, guys, this is not the end of the road. We will pick ourselves back up. So, Cerezo, I'd like to have you on this show tomorrow. Let's just, let's dust, the, let's, let's take the dust off our shoulders and, and find a way to move forward because it is what it is. We will not be at the World Cup, but we can start rebuilding our football today. Yeah, we can. Um, we, we've been here before, and I just hope this time it will be different. We'll start doing things. We'll look at the whole picture and not just address the national teams, develop our football. Uh, I'm hoping. All right, this, this, this was what I dreaded, and now we're getting to it. Uh, the draws for the FIFA 2022 World Cup will be held tomorrow. And then again, the pain just comes back. Let's look at the pots. Uh, of course, pots one to four, where you have the teams... Uh, and, of course, the draws will be held tomorrow uh, in Port 1. You have the host Qatar, Brazil, Belgium, France, Argentina, England, Spain, and Portugal. All of these teams in Port 1. In Port 2, uh, which will come up on your uh, screen shortly, uh, you also have Mexico, Netherlands, Denmark, Germany, Uruguay, Switzerland, United States, and Croatia in Port 2. In Port 3, uh, you have uh, teams like the Teranga Lions of Senegal, Iran, Japan, Morocco, Serbia, Poland, Korea Republic, and Tunisia. And of course, in Port 4, in Port 4, you have some teams like Cameroon, Canada, Ecuador, Saudi Arabia, Ghana, and you have the uh, inter intercontinental uh, playoffs that's going to produce uh, two teams and the Euro playoff as well that's going to throw one team in the mix. All right, let's move on on the show. Now, what's uh, football gambling buddy FIFA has been talking about uh, the 2022 World Cup and, of course, uh, what's coming from the mouth of the president himself, uh, Yanni Infantino, uh, if used, and he is sure that Qatar will host a World Cup uh, that everyone will remember. Let's listen to Yanni Infantino uh, uh, share his thoughts on the ability of uh, Qatar to put up a world-class event. I think it, it, will be a, it will be a great World Cup. It will be a unique World Cup. In terms of the, of the legacy, uh, I think we are already witnessing the legacy of this World Cup before even it started in terms of uh, the social impact it had uh, for uh, uh, people, for workers uh, here, for human rights in, uh, in Qatar, in the whole Middle East. It will be a unique World Cup. Never ever, I think, in future we'll have 
such a compact World Cup where eight stadiums are within 50 kilometers. Um, not only fans can watch more than one game per day, but more importantly, there is no travel for the players, for the national teams. They are here, and once they are here, they stay here. All right. Yanni, welcome back. Yanni Infantino uh, speaking his mind. Uh, but there's never been a doubt about the ability of Qatar. Even when they won the Austin rights and some of the things they showed us, we, we knew they were ready. And a few months down the line, you, you, for, for once, you could agree with Yanni Infantino that, yes, these guys are ready. Uh, which makes it more painful. Uh, that we're Nigeria not going to be there. there. Um, like I, I said before, I, I saw lots of the plans. I saw lots of infrastructure, documentaries. And I kept telling myself, Nigeria has to be at the old soccer. But again, it is what it is. The reality is that we are not going. So we are, at yeah. least we won't, uh, we'll probably, for those who have huge pressure, you watch the World Cup with pressure. You can enjoy the games. Mm -hmm. but as a neutral. As a neutral. Planning, obviously, the, I'm sure they'll give us state-of-the-art Tournament, we would have fun. The designs, documentaries, everything. Especially shows if it right. the dress rehearsal was anything to go by. Yeah, that FIFA it means, Cup. It just shows we're us we're gonna I, have. I think everyone is now waiting for the competitions cup that will come up in the summer. And then after that, we'll have a semblance of what the World Cup will look like. I think we would have, irrespective, the World Cup normally brings everyone together. You would definitely enjoy it, irrespective of whether your country is there or not. So let's see what Qatar will bring different. Um, like they've told us, the no matter what the weather is outside. It won't really affect whatever mm -hmm. it's going to be. That alone is attractive to the ear. So yes. let's see what they can come up with. The president has said they are ready. Hopefully, it won't be words of mouth alone. We would enjoy the World Cup in Qatar. All right. Uh, let me pass the bet to the Austin now. Um, I agree with Yanni Infantino on this one. The next one is, um, I, I don't know if Austin feels the way I feel, but, I, but I'm going to allow you, uh, you know, say whatever you want to say about it. Yanni Infantino... <laughs> Well, just, just say something briefly because uh, we're going to go on a break. But Yanni Fantino is saying, well, we, we never said, we never had any proposal for Biennial World Cup. We, 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 we just wanted to talk about it. Because I, I, I'm sure the Nigerians that are there now will whisper to his ears that 2026 is too far. So can we have the Biennial World Cup now? But, but I have no doubt that Qatar we do a great job, you know, because they have really prepared. I remember passing through Doha one time and I saw the work that they've done. Uh, they put the, the display, the stadium models out there for people to see, to let you start, you know, you know, longing to see the World Cup. They've invested heavily on infrastructure, uh, logistics, top-notch. You know, this is what we talk about, long-term planning, you know, and preparation. So uh, I agree with Infantino, you know, we're going to have a great World Cup. But that's say, I mean, let's just put a pause on the conversation, go on this quick break. When we come back, the official match ball for the Qatar 2022 FIFA World Cup has been unveiled. We'll see it when we come back. Don't go anywhere. Stay. Welcome back tonight on Channels Television. Let's get right into the discussion. I told you that the official match ball for the 2022 FIFA World Cup has been unveiled. It is called Al Rila. Uh, it has been revealed by Adidas uh, right there in Qatar. And um, it has this stunning, sustainable and high quality uh, match ball from Adidas, that's it right there. Looks stunning, Bolu. Sadly, Victor of Simen will not kick this, or Diony Allo won't kick it because Nigeria won't be at the World Cup. I think one man I won't pity is uh, Mosimen. Remember 2019 AFCON, he didn't really play, he said he was there to learn. This 2021 in 2022 AFCON, um, he was not there due to club issues. Now World Cup, he won't be there. That's one man I really pity. But uh, we would have, uh, we'll, I'm sure by next week, we'll have replicas of this ball in Nigeria. So we'll play the replica. But again, it looks beautiful to the sight. And uh, it's unfortunately, we won't be kicking it. We would have loved to see how it feels like. You had the Jabulanis and Koso. I really are definitely like every match ball will get the attention. And you can see like what we have on the screen. There are loads of attention, loads of images, pictures and all. So let's see if Alila Rila will be like Jabulanis or will be like the other regular form. The, the ball was designed with sustainability as a priority. Indeed, Ariel Al is the first FIFA World Cup ball to be made exclusively with water-based inks and glues. But before uh, we talked about this ball, Yemi mentioned that uh, Gianni Infantino uh, whispered that, look, we didn't drop any proposal for a Barnier World Cup. So let's just shift from 
uh, the match ball and listen to Gianni Fatino once again. Let me be very clear that FIFA has not proposed a biennial World Cup. Let's get the process clear here. The last FIFA Congress asked the FIFA administration with a vote in which 88% voted in favor to study the feasibility of a World Cup every two years and some other projects related to women's football and youth football. Now FIFA, the FIFA administration, under the leadership of Arsene Wenger, did exactly that. We studied the feasibility. But FIFA did not propose anything. FIFA came to the conclusion that it is feasible, that it would have some repercussions and impacts. But once this certified, the next phase starts, and it's the phase of consultation. It's the phase of discussion. It's the phase of trying to find agreements and compromises. Hmm. So that's it. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, what Infantino was trying to say is there's no official proposal yet. Yes, we talk about it. Yes, we're looking at the possibilities of having a Bionia World Cup, but um, you just say everybody calm down. So it, it looks like um, that plan is already dead and arrived. Now. Sure, it is. Sure, it is. And, and that's a fitting way uh, to close the show. Uh, tonight, uh, but Infantino, uh, I'll play some clips later on. But we'll leave it at that for now. Uh, first, I want to thank Bolu Omoni for his time uh, on the show tonight. It was good having you with us. Hopefully, we'll do this again some other time. Yeah, it's always a pleasure being here. All right, that's the show today. Uh, we do hope that you've enjoyed everything we've been able to do. We'll be back here again tomorrow. I mean, I'm here to buy. Bye bye now. Yeah, I'm saying that I'll be back tomorrow. I won't change my mouth after, after tonight. That's the show. In London, I'm Austin O'Connor. And in everything you do, remember, keep talking sports. Bye for now. <laughs> <laughs>